far as I know, he's uh, not even a believing Jewish scientist. Uh, but he wrote a book, Not By Chance, Shattering the Modern Theory of Evolution, back in 1998. He's an expert on mutations, and this whole book is about mutations. And in this, he says, All point mutations that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information and not to increase it. He even gives an example. He says, with this picture, no mutations have ever been observed that have converted an animal to a markedly different species, say from a fly to a wasp. I mean, that's not a very big change to go from a fly to a wasp. But he says, we haven't even observed a mutation to make that kind of a change. You see, an amoeba has certain information in its DNA for making an amoeba. But it has no information for making legs or hair or a nose or a stomach or eyeballs. A horse has genetic information for making all of those parts. But an amoeba does not. So you cannot make a horse by taking the DNA information in an amoeba and just copying it over and over and making mistakes in the copying process as you go. You have to have new information added to the uh, DNA molecule. But then evolutionists say, yes, that's true about mutations. They generally do decrease the information, but there are some beneficial mutations. But we've got to be careful here. We've got to define what we mean by beneficial. And we've got to pay attention to what happens to the information in the process. One example is a bacterium called H. pylori. These are nasty little critters that uh, patients don't like and doctors don't like. And so doctors have figured out that there's an antibiotic that will kill these uh, little critters. And here's how it works. The antibiotic is taken by the patient. It's absorbed into the system. And then the bacteria living in the patient absorbs that antibiotic through the cell wall of the bacterium. Then it produces an enzyme that converts that antibiotic to a poison and the poison kills the bacterium. It's assisted suicide. Okay? But there's a problem. Sometimes the H. pylori has a mutant. And so the mutant absorbs the antibiotic through the cell wall. But because of a mutation in its genetic information, it does not have the ability to make an, the enzyme that will convert the antibiotic into poison. So, it can't make the enzyme, therefore it doesn't produce the poison, therefore it doesn't die. It survives. Now, it is survived, however, by a loss of information. So, we compare the two then. A healthy, normal H. pylori takes the antibiotic in, it dies. But the mutant can't produce the enzyme, so it survives and then it reproduces and then it gives headaches to the doctors and the patients and they have to figure out a different antibiotic to try to get rid of uh, the mutant. There was a beneficial mutation for the H. pylori. It did allow it to survive, but it survived because of a loss of information. It was not on its way to becoming something other and better than an H. pylori. It's a defective H. pylori. I live in Cincinnati, and uh, suppose I wanted to go on a train to Chicago. And so I take my trusty train schedule with me and I go down to the Cincinnati train station. And I don't pay attention to any of the signs. I've got my trusty train schedule with me. And my train schedule says that the train to Chicago is on platform 14. So I walk to platform 14, get on the train. Unfortunately, there was a mutation in my train schedule. The train on platform 14 is not going to Chicago. It's going to Atlanta. The train that's going to Chicago is on platform 24. I'm on the wrong platform. It does not matter how slowly that train on platform 14 goes. It can move a centimeter a century and it will never get me to Chicago because it is going in the wrong direction. It's going downhill and I need to be going uphill. Well, the train of natural selection and mutation is the train that the evolutionists say will take us from a single-celled creature all the way to all the diverse and complex plants and animals we see in the world, which would involve increased information. 
The problem is that the train of natural selection and mutation is going in the wrong direction. It's not going in the direction of increased information. It's going in the direction of decreased information. And Lee Spetner makes a humorous analogy in his book, Not By Chance. He says, whoever thinks macroevolution can be made by mutations that lose information is like the merchant who lost a little money on every sale but thought he could make it up on volume. You know, I'm, a, I, I'm a, a, in the broom business. I buy my brooms for a dollar and I sell them for 80 cents. And I come home after the first day and I say, Honey, we, I, I took a beating. Uh, I lost a lot of money. But don't worry. We're going to get that vacation to Hawaii. I'm going to double my sales tomorrow. No, you're not going to get to Hawaii that way. Losing information is not the way to gain information. Losing money is not the way to make money. And so... How do we fit the mutations into the creationist view? Well, the Bible says that we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. The Bible says that we live in a corrupted, fallen, cursed world. It's not the original perfect creation that God made. And so mutations are the God-ordained consequences of His curse on creation because of Adam's sin. And so we can very soundly assume that before Adam and Eve sinned, there were no mutations because there was no disease, there was no death. But then Adam sinned and that brought the judgment of God on the creation, it brought death and we know from our study of mutations that the mutations are increasing in the human genome. We're getting more and more genetic problems. But the Bible says there will come a day when there will be no more death, no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering those mutations will be gone. So right now, we live in a cursed world where there are mutations. So let's conclude then. We can say on the basis of studying both the fossils and living things that undirected random natural processes like mutation and natural selection, time and chance and physical processes, plus time does not equal complex functional design. It takes intelligence to produce complex design. And you know what? The evolutionists know this. And they even reason this way when it suits their purposes. There is not an evolutionist on this planet who would walk into a cave, say, in South Africa and see these objects laying on the floor, a piece of wood with some uh, animal skin wrapped around one end of a stone, and then uh, a string with a whole bunch of hornet's bodies uh, strung together and a piece of bone that looks like a horse head, and a piece of stone that looks like it could be a spear point, there's not an evolutionist who would see that and say, isn't it amazing what happened as a result of the wind blowing in this cave and some animals rummaging around? It just produced these things. No. They say, this is proof positive. There were human beings in this cave. They also do it when they're looking into outer space. The SETI program uses this radio telescope in Puerto Rico twice a year to listen to sounds coming from outer space. What are they listening for? They're listening for some kind of organized pattern of sounds, irregular patterns that are organized, that have some repetition and complexity to them, that are different from random noise. And they have now uh, recruited thousands of people all over the world to use their PCCs to link into the SETI computers to analyze this stuff. And they've been doing this for years. What will they think if they hear a sound of organized pattern of sounds? They will say, there it is, proof positive, we're not alone in the universe, there are alien beings out there. Even though they can't see them, even though they don't know what the message means, they will know that that is evidence of intelligence. See, they use it the same principle to prove their theory. But it doesn't. It refutes their theory. So the evolution tree of life, just as Michael Denton said, as I quoted in the first part of the lay rule out of mind, they say there was no